Welcome to the National Library of Medicine, to all of you here and everyone watching remotely via NIH videocast. And if you're following us on Twitter while you're watching, please use the hashtag NLMHistTalk. My name is Jeff Resnick. I'm chief of the NLM's History of Medicine Division, sponsor of this program, which is part of our History of Medicine lecture series. The series is designed to promote awareness and use of NLM and other historical collections for research, education, and public service in biomedicine, the social sciences, and the humanities. Before I introduce today's speaker, I mentioned that our next lecture is going to be held on Tuesday, October 4th at 2 o'clock Eastern Time in Lipset Auditorium, which is located in Building 10 here on the NIH campus. On that day, we will be welcoming the Honorable Dr. Louis W. Sullivan, U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Services from 1989 to 1993. We're thrilled to welcome Dr. Sullivan on that day when he'll be speaking on a personal perspective on race, opportunity, and the U.S. health system. And like our lecture today and all of our lectures, Dr. Sullivan's lecture will be live streamed and archived for future viewing. So it's a great pleasure for me this afternoon to introduce our speaker, Dr. Uh, Brett Bobley, as part of NLM's ongoing partnership with the National Endowment for the Humanities to develop initiatives that bring together specialists from the humanities and medicine and information sciences to share expert expertise and develop new research agendas. This partnership began in 2012. We reaffirmed it last year in 2015, and we've collaborated wonderfully along the way with a number of great partners. And today's speaker himself has been an outstanding partner in all that we've accomplished together, and all for the benefit of research that is, as we all know, derived uh, increasingly collaborative, interdisciplinary, and involving larger and larger data sets derived from both digitized and born digital resources. Our speaker, Brett Bobley, is the Chief Information Officer for the National Endowment for the Humanities. He serves as the Director of the Office of Digital Humanities at NEH as well. Brett holds a bachelor's degree in philosophy from the University of Chicago and a master's degree in computer science from Johns Hopkins University. Brett is the recipient of two very significant awards, a Chief Information Officer's Council Leadership Award from the Office of Management and Budget, which he received in 2006, and the following year he received a Presidential Rank Award from the President of the United States in recognition of his exceptional long-term accomplishments such as co-founding the federal government's small agency CIO Council and establishing the NIH Office of Digital Humanities. Please join me in welcoming Brett here to the National Library of Medicine and to hear his presentation this afternoon on international big data research in the humanities and social sciences, collaboration, opportunity, and outcomes. Welcome, Brett. Hello. Okay. Got my clicker. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate you coming out today. And uh, thank you, Jeff, for having me. Um, it's been really fun to visit. I was just actually at the NSF this morning. I'm hitting all the grant-making agencies during the course of my day. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about a, a few topics. Here are kind of the main things I want to hit today. I want to, first of all, explain to you what the NEH is. Um, oftentimes, when people say, who do you work for? I say, NEH. And they go, oh, in Bethesda, right? Because, yeah, anyway, you probably don't get that as much as I do. Um, I want to talk about what the research goals of this new grant program this I'm talking about today, the Digging Into Data Challenge. I also want to talk to you, because you're grant makers and I'm a grant maker, I want to talk to you a little about the logistics and what goes into a large international grant program involving many different funders and many different disciplines. And lastly, I'll give you some examples of some of the research that we have funded over the few years to give you a, a better sense of, of, of what this grant program is all about and what kind of research we're hoping to fund. Okay, so first of all, who is the NEH? Um, we are, uh, we just celebrated our 50th anniversary. Um, we are the primary federal funder for, the for all the humanities disciplines. Um, to give you a sense of budget, blue is the NIH budget, <laughs> red is NSF, and green is my budget. That's the NEH budget. I know it's very hard to see. Um, our current budget is about $147 million. So we are very, very small. That said, though, we fund a lot of the disciplines that you would find on a, on a, on a college campus. Um, this is kind of a breakdown, as you can see, things like history, literature, languages, philosophy. The researchers in those areas, we are the primary funder for that in the United States. So that, I like to think that even though our budget is small, the coverage that we have is important. And of course, research is a holistic discipline. 
interdisciplinary research is really, really increasingly important. So I like to think that the humanities disciplines play an important role overall in the research landscape uh, here in the United States. So I run something called the Office of Digital Humanities. I, I have an unusual job, as Jeff mentioned, because I, I actually am on the program and grant making side at the NEH. Um, and I'm also the CIO, so I'm on the admin side as well. In a small agency, it's not that uncommon for people to kind of have two hats. Um, the Office of Digital Humanities, we fund projects that really focus on cyber infrastructure. That is to say, the technology and the technological methods for doing research is one of the major things that we focus on. Um, so we, we, things like text mining, uh, geospatial analysis, um, net, com, uh, computerized net, uh, social networking, um, all kinds of new technologies and methods that humanities scholars are increasingly using for their research. Okay. Um, as Jeff mentioned, we have an MOU and a memorandum of understanding with the NLM, um, and we, it's been terrific working with, with, with the library. Um, libraries play an unbelievably important role for the humanities because they are the memory institution that hold the research materials that our researchers use. So it's been great working with NLM. Um, we've done a number of things together. Two highlights, we did a, a symposium in 2013 on data biomedicine and digital humanities over at the University of Maryland. Um, we also, just in 2016, um, did a workshop here on the NIH campus called Images and Text in Medical History, uh, which was an, the idea behind that one was to help medical historians, to train medical historians on some of the latest techniques in, in data mining and, and geospatial analysis, new ways for them to do their research using the holdings of the NLM and other uh, li med medical libraries around the world. So, digging into data. Um, this is this grant program I, I, I'm here to tell you about. Uh, I founded it in 2009. Um, the idea here is that when you think about a humanities scholar, people often think about, you know, the, the kind of lone scholar in the library writing a book by herself, that kind of a thing. But that stereotype, while true to an extent, is definitely falling away um, in the digital era. And more and more, this notion of big data is becoming very important in the humanities and the social sciences, not just in the medical sciences and, 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 other, uh, and other disciplines as well. Um, if, you, if you ask about what the definition of big data is, you can look at the Wikipedia definition. I actually like this definition that, that Saeed Chowdhury, um, who's at Johns Hopkins University, has mentioned. He, he said, data becomes big when a research community finds it must create new methods to use and analyze it. I think that's a really terrific definition because, you know, sometimes, depending on what research discipline you're in, three terabytes might be very small or it might be incredibly large. It just depends on what you're researching and what you're trying to do. And that's why in the humanities, in particular, this is an important point. Uh, it, to give you a, a quick example, um, historians, for example, often study, for example, in newspapers, right? Historians might read old newspapers to learn about history. But now that newspapers are available, literally in the hundreds of millions of pages have been digitized, and you have access to more newspaper material than ever before, that becomes a big data challenge because you now have to use computational methods to parse all that information that you didn't use before. So what kinds of things do humanities scholars typically study? So this is, this is, this is, a, this is a refresher, <laughs> all right? If you think about it, humanities scholars and social scientists study people. Or more precisely, they study stuff that people make to learn about people. So to give you a quick example, a humanities or a social science research, re researcher very well might study books. They might study music or art or newspapers. These are the things that traditionally humanities and social scientists have studied to do their research. But these very items are really changing in the last 20 years in particular to digital. Think about books. Books are now available on a very large scale in a digital format, which means you can read them or a computer can read them in ways that they can never be read before. Think about music. Again, we think of it as an analog thing. I have a 13-year-old boy who loves music. He's never held a record in his life. Everything is digital when it comes to music, and that's a, an important thing that humanists study. Art, newspapers. Um, in general, what we're seeing here is that the daily record of life in the past is being digitized madly. We're digitizing everything we can think of. And the daily record of life in the present is born digital. 
And these things are happening very rapidly. So the very things that humanities and social scientists study are now becoming digital. And they're becoming in very, very large sizes. So this is one of the reasons why I'm really leading the charge at the NEH to say, look, humanities scholars need to learn new methods and new techniques to do their research. Because the things that they study are now in massive digital form. And the old methods are not going to cut it anymore. Um, as a quick example about, digit say, digitized books, um, this is a, a great quote from, from uh, a paper in Science a couple of years ago. The Google Books corpus, which is a digital book corpus you've seen on, on the web, contains over 500 billion words. The sequence of letters is 1,000 times longer than the human genome. If you wrote it out in a straight line, it would reach to the moon and back. And these are the books that humanities scholars study, and they now have tantalizing access to it in a, in a com using computational methods, but it's a very, very big data set. There are twice as many words posted on Twitter every day that have appeared in the New York Times over the last 60 years. And this actually is from a couple of years ago. I would bet you this statistic is even bigger now. Again, if you're studying human behavior, the data set you're studying has become very, very large. Okay. So here are a couple of observations that I made that led me to creating this new grant program. So observation one is simply that our ability to digitize stuff has exceeded our ability to analyze them. We've become, we've become really good at digitizing materials. We can digitize at massive scale, but our methods for analyzing needs, need to catch up. Number two, we haven't figured out how to take advantage of the large scale. In other words, what new research insights can we, can we, can we, can we find if we're utilizing big data methods that we couldn't do before? Number three, libraries and archives are very, very important players here, but they need to learn new ways to present their data. In other words, when a researcher comes to a, a library and they say, you know, 20 years ago they might have said, I'd like to check out a couple of books. Now they say, I want to check out 3 million books. It's a very different idea for the librarian. The librarian has a new kind of patron from the researcher. They need to know how to make their collections digital and provide it in, met, in ways that the researcher can, can leverage for the research. And number four, the problems we're trying to address here are inherently interdisciplinary. Many of the data mining techniques that my researchers do are very, very similar to the ones that biomedical researchers use. This is, an, this is something that a, a lot of these techniques come from business analytics. A lot of them come from, 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 from uh, uh, chemistry. A lot of different disciplines are involved in developing these new methods. So it really is important to see the different disciplines working together. And it isn't just a humanities issue, and it's not just an American issue. So the idea behind digging into data was to create an international grant program aimed at developing new big data research methods for the humanities and social sciences. So I started calling other funders. I got in touch with domestic funders like NSF. I got in touch with funders in Canada in Mexico, France, Germany. And what I discovered is that nearly every research agency I talked to was struggling with this exact same problem. How are we going to do research in the 21st century with all these large collections? And every, every, every funder I talked to said, man, we're dealing with that. Let's, let's talk about how on an international basis we can start to develop this new infrastructure and these new techniques. And that's what led to the Digging Data, Data Challenge back in 2009. So, as I mentioned, we've been around for a while now. We're, we, we're, we've, we've funded uh, three rounds of this program already in 2009, 11, 13, et cetera. We are now working on round four of this grant program. And the program has gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, we started off with just uh, three countries involved. We now have 11 countries involved. Um, in fact, we're now co-sponsored by the Transatlantic Platform which is an international organization of funding agencies in the humanities and social sciences that meet periodically and talk about um, how they can work together to fund new kinds of projects. So TAP is one of our co-sponsors now. So this has really become a big program. We have 16 different research funders involved. Um, here's a quick list of all the different funders involved. Um, as you can see, we have um, domestic people like NSF, NEH, and IMLS. We've got, in, in Europe, uh, we have the UK, Finland, France, Germany, Portugal, the Netherlands. We've got, uh, on our side of the Atlantic, we have Canada, US, Mexico, 
Argentina, Brazil. Uh, so it's a really, really growing. More and more funders are very interested in this topic and joining up with the Digging Into Data Challenge. Okay. So you might be wondering about from a logistics perspective, particularly if, if, if you're a funder yourself, how do you deal with a grant program that has 11 countries and 16 different funders? It's a, it is a complex task. But I thought I'd talk a little bit about it in case you were wrestling with the idea of, of, of creating an international grant program. Um, just sort of let you know how, how we did it, because it might be interesting. Okay. So one fundamental question is, how do you actually make awards? Right? You've got 16 funders and 16 different kinds of money and, and lots of different governments involved. Typically, in the international world, there are two methods. One method is the common pot method. The idea behind common pot is that each country puts grant money in a big pot. And then you have your grant competition, you do your peer review, and whoever the top ones are get funded out of that pot. Um, it's a nice, it, it's very clean and relatively straightforward, but there are a lot of legal obstacles to it. In a lot of countries, the common pot just won't work. And here in the US, there are a lot of legal obstacles to us taking our money and putting it in a pot with other countries. Because by, our legislation requires us to fund only American-based universities. So, um, the common pot method works pretty well in, in the EU, for example, because they have enough, um, they already have prior relationships. But the common pot method really wouldn't work because we have so many different countries involved that really wouldn't allow for that. So we went with the second method called the fund own method. And this actually has very, been working very, very smoothly. Um, the idea behind the fund own method is that international teams apply for your grants and they are peer-reviewed by an international peer review committee. But at the end of the day, you make grants only to universities within your own country. So it makes it very clean and easy. So to, to give you uh, an example, if there was a research team from, say, Oxford University and the University of Chicago that won the grant, they, they would actually win two grants. I would give a grant to Chicago, and the ESRC in the UK would give a grant to Oxford. So there's actually multiple grants going on. But, this technique works pretty well, it's pretty clean. Okay. So here's an example to show you what, I, what I'm talking about. Here's one of our grants that we made in this program called Digging, Digging Archaeological Data. Um, this particular team had three PIs, one from Amsterdam, one from the UK, one from Canada. Um, they created a single joint proposal and they submit it. The project is peer reviewed. We decide to fund it. They ultimately get three awards, which is to say the, the Dutch funder gives a grant to the University of Amsterdam, the British funder gives one to the University of York, the Canadian funder gives a grant to the University of Saskatchewan. But the beauty here is that these PIs didn't have to write three different grants. They wrote one grant proposal, and they all win grants if, they get, if, they're, if they're selected for award. Um, it really, it, it, a, lot of, a lot of the PIs have told us that this is a wonderful program for them. Because oftentimes a PI wants to work with an international colleague but the chances of them both applying for a grant in their respective country and both getting it at the same time is very low. This way they work together, they apply for the grant, they, they all get grants at one time, enables them to move forward with their work. Peer review, again, it's ha handled on an international basis. Applications come in, we break them out by their disciplines. Um, we, have outside we have two outside uh, specialty reviewers, review each one. We then send them to disciplinary panels and then ultimately, the panelists rate and rank all the applications, and the top-rated ones are then funded using the, the funding method I mentioned a moment ago. So it works out pretty well. We, like I said, we've been doing this since, since 2009, so we've got it down to a, a good rhythm. It works fairly smoothly. Um, our, next, our next set of peer review panels will be taking place in Buenos Aires, Argentina in November. So we're looking forward to that. We had our largest deadline ever. Uh, some exciting projects will come out of it. Uh, we'll be announcing those early winter. So you might be asking, why? What is the value of doing an international competition? Because it is more work. I mean, doing a grant competition with 16 funders is a lot of overhead from our perspective, from a funder's perspective. But I think it's well worth it when you look at the quality of the research that we're able to fund. Um, there are a number of reasons why. Um, I think that, as I mentioned, bullet point number two, I mentioned that a moment ago, if two or more researchers want to work together, it's not easy to get multiple grants. This program solves that problem. Um, I also think the collaboration among the funders is important. I have learned so much working with other research funders around the world. Um, I think it's important. I mean, science is an international endeavor. 
and it's only becoming increasingly more international. And by being able to talk with our peers in other countries that are funding similar research has proven a lot of benefits over and above just the particular grant program. And the last one is leveraging of funds. And this is really, really critical, certainly for us, because we're a small agency that does not have a lot of money. Let me give you an example. For this current round of digging into data, my agency is putting in $700,000. But that'll lead to awards of about $10 million. In other words, because there are 16 agencies all putting in money, our overall pot is much, much larger than I could ever fund by myself. As a result, we can fund some very large teams of researchers to do very large-scale projects that I could never afford on my own. I mean, to give you an example, at the NEH, the typical, the largest research grant we ever make is probably around $300,000. And that's, for the humanities, that's a fairly large grant. But in this program, we'll be funding some very large projects that have three or four or five PIs and their graduate students. That could be a one to two million dollar really big project. We'll be able to fund these because we're participating with these other countries and we're leveraging our dollars to fund terrific projects that are out of our scope in terms of how much money that we have, the NEH. Okay. So lastly, um, you're probably curious, well, what types of stuff have you been funding? So I want to just go over a couple of quick highlights of some of the different types of projects we funded. And I'm pleased to say it's a wide variety of different projects, and it's really fascinating how the field, when they saw this idea, okay, big data, humanities, and social science, what does that mean? Um, the field always impresses you and excites you with the stuff that they're funding. So here's a few examples. Um, here's a project that we funded in the first round, digging into image data. This is a computer vision project. Um, in other words, training a computer to look at artwork, uh, on the right hand, uh, maps, and quilts. I'll talk about the quilts for a moment. Um, there are libraries that have thousands and thousands of quilts and museums that have, have, have thousands of quilts on hand. It's a very, and, and art historians study the history of quilts. What this group did is they trained a computer to be able to look at images of quilts and actually computationally analyze the colors and the patterns in the quilts to help identify, for example, who created the quilts, what, what type of style they're using. It's a really interesting art history project that takes advantage of very much a very cutting edge computer vision technology. Um, here's another one. This one was actually featured in the New York Times a couple of years ago called Digging into the Enlightenment. Um, this is a social networking project, which is really uh, interesting. Um, they make the case that during the Enlightenment, um, they, they had social networks, not, like, not, not quite the same as Twitter and, and Facebook, but people like Ben Franklin and, and, and John Locke were constantly writing letters to each other. Great philosophers, historians, artists were writing, were writing thousands of letters to one another. They are using network analysis techniques borrowed from mathematics to try to learn more and analyze the social network around the world, and specifically how ideas were transferred from great thinkers around the world via the letters that they wrote. Here's one on the history of crime, which is actually quite interesting. Um, in the UK, the, uh, some of you might be familiar with the Old Bailey. It's a central court in London. Um, the UK government recently digitized every single court case in the Old Bailey, going back many hundreds of years. So it's a fascinating history of crime in Great Britain. But it is such a huge database that this team is using text mining techniques to search and learn about trends in the history of crime. And, they're able, and they're able, their, their, their findings are really outstanding. They're able to find interesting trends in the history of crime that, that no one had seen before, only by looking, by stepping back and using a big data approach to see how court sentences and types of crimes had changed over time. Um, here's one um, that you might be familiar with, the epidemiology of information. This one uh, is one that certainly crosses over into the biomedical sciences. Um, this one was looking at the 1918 flu. And in particular, they were looking at newspaper coverage of the 1918 flu. So this is a history of medicine project. Uh, one of the things that, that is fascinating about any pandemic, of course, is how newspaper coverage of the pandemic impacts a disease vector. In other words, how newspaper coverage, uh, what, what kinds of advice were they giving to people? How did coverage in one city versus coverage in another city impact which cities were hit worse than others? So again, they're using a big data, data mining technique to study thousands of pages of newspapers 
1917, 18, and 19 to try to see what, the, what the, some of the disease vectors were like. And I, and I can see Jeff he, he, he sent me this. As I can see, it's circulating now. I did have a, a guest post, I think, about this project. Here's another project that uh, is related to the biomedical sciences as well. It's the Impact Radiological Mummy Database. Now, this was an interesting project. It was um, St. Luke's, the PI from St. Luke's was a cardiologist, and the PI from Western is an anthropologist. And it's a really terrific uh, partnership, I think, because the, the idea was to study mummies and to learn more about disease, but to take it from the perspective of both the anthropologist and the cardiologist. Now, this one um, ended up, the cardiologist ended up publishing a very influential paper in The Lancet, um, which actually led to all kinds of coverage in, 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 in newspapers around the world, basically suggesting that by studying CAT scans of mummies, what they determined is that a lot of ancient mummies died of heart disease, which was unexpected to see so much um, heart disease and clogged arteries in ancient, in ancient peoples. Um, so this, it, it created quite, a, quite, a, quite a, a, a stir. Here's the article in uh, Popular Science about it. Uh, in particular, what they were doing is they, 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 they contacted a, about 60 or 70 different museums around the world that had mummies. And they were able to get all these museums to share their um, CAT scan data of their mummies so that they could look at them globally and sort of see what mummies from different cultures and compare them acro across the whole world in different time frames. But in addition to the biomedical research of the cardiologist publishing in The Lancet, we also saw the anthropologist um, published in his own journal talking about evisceration tradition in ancient mummies because they were also looking at how, um, how for example, mummies' uh, organs had been pulled out and rearranged in various uh, religious uh, um, um, ceremonies that are done to ancient mummies. So again, I, I, like, I like an interdisciplinary project where both disciplines can publish in other words, there are important research questions in multiple disciplines that came out of this project. Here's another one. This is an interesting collaboration uh, between poets and computer scientists. They actually built a system that computationally analyzes poetry. And this is a great quote from one of the PIs, Catherine, Catherine Coles at University of Utah. She mentions here, we discovered early on that we and the computer scientists have very different approaches to the material. They are, much more systematic, they are much more systematic than we are, and they really want to be able to pin things down. And it's not the instinct of the poet to want to pin things down. Um, she, I, I, had a, I heard a great talk that she and the computer science team gave about how much they learn from each other trying to computationally analyze poetry. And you can actually go to their website, by the way, and you can punch in poems, and it breaks it down by, by meter and syntax using techniques from computational linguistics. Here's one. Um, as I mentioned, music is a, is a huge field. Computational musicology is huge right now because there's so much digital music available and there's a lot of projects going on. This is one out of MIT that is um, looking at, it's a data-driven project to look at musical style. So again, I, I throw in these examples just to show you that the Digging into Data Challenge has funded quite a wide variety of different projects across the humanities and social sciences. Here's a linguistics one. Um, this is an interesting project. These linguists are actually using Twitter to try to predict what new words will enter the English language in the future. Because oftentimes, new words show up. They're often created by young people, and you often see them on social networks before they hit the general lexicon. For example, the word selfie. Now, you probably all think that word's been around forever. It was only invented about three years ago. Before that, it didn't exist. Before that, you would have said, I took a picture of myself with my camera. You would not have said selfie because it didn't exist. But what these guys are doing is they're actually studying Twitter to find out what these new words are. And it also helps linguists learn about how words are created. Um, you may have seen in the New York Times, the team that did this also published this language quiz in the New York Times, which is incredibly popular. And what they did is they, they, it's a quiz where, they, where they, they show you all these new words that you may not have heard, and you have to answer the quiz. And then after you take the quiz, it can predict things about you. It can try to guess, for example, what part of the world you live in and things like that, because, again, they're studying where these new words generate uh, geographically. Okay? 
And lastly, I will note, um, we've been recognized the last couple of years, the IEEE, they have a big international conference on big data, and they do these special workshops on what they call big humanities. And at the last meeting in 2014, seven of the 16 papers accepted to the conference were PIs from our Digging Into Data Challenge. So in a lot of ways, when it comes to big data, humanities, and social science, this program has really been successful in, make, in, in kind of launching that field and making it uh, uh, really viable. Okay? That's all I've got. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Um, the question is about methodologies. It's a tough one because there are so many. Um, we have funded, at this point, I think about 35 or so different projects. And um, it's hard to say, it's hard to pin down just one. I will definitely say, uh, I mean, computer vision, we've seen a lot of. It's, it seems very popular. Certainly, um, natural language processing, very popular. Because a lot of humanities disciplines are text-based. I mean, obviously, music, musicology is not, art history is not. But if you think of like history, philosophy, literature, very text-based. So a lot of the methods are really borrowed from the computational linguistics and natural language processing fields. Um, and in fact, it's interesting how um, I think that over the, what I've seen over the last 10 years is more and more demand from the humanities field to collaborate with people from NLP and, and, and computational linguistics. Because I think that all, a lot of these techniques were invented by, by the computational linguistics people as an exercise in linguistics before these big data sets were available. And now people are like, oh man, I need expertise. Will you come help me? Because I'm, I'm trying to study Shakespeare and I know you've developed methods for studying these, these, these things that, 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 we, that we don't have. So um, We've seen a lot of that. I think social network analysis is, is another one we're seeing a lot of. Um, there are some very interesting techniques um, that come out of, uh, out of applied mathematics for studying networks and nodes. And a lot of people are trying to take that kind of technology and apply it to different areas in the humanities. I mean, for example, um, certainly in language, trying to see how words affect other words and how words move from one language to another. Um, certainly we're seeing it in, in, in history. Um, how ideas translate from great thinkers, as we, I mentioned one of the projects earlier. And even in literature, there are people doing social network analysis of novels. So, for example, a, a network analysis of the, of, of the characters within William Faulkner's books. Because, you know, almost all of Faulkner's books take place in the same county. So there are characters across all of, no, all of his novels. People are doing analysis of that to see how their social interaction plays out within Faulkner's novel. So quite a, quite a few different, different, different methods we've been seeing. Yes, sir. So most of the um, examples were from humanities more than I would think social science. Yeah. Uh, do you have any projects where people are actually looking at um, how the community is using big data? In other words, the process itself, maybe through a network analysis, mm. Um, and maybe even in the sciences or scientists uh, are some domains of science using um, certain approaches better or more than others in terms mm. of open data and so forth? It's an interesting question. Not so, not, there have not been any of, uh, uh, yet uh, that I've seen on that area. Yeah, I, I, th I think that within, within the purview of the program, it's very wide. Um, basically, they have to have, they have to be, trying to address a humanities or social sciences research question is number one. And then number two, they have to be utilizing a big data approach to try to answer those questions. So it's wide open in that sense. Um, we have had some project, we've had, I didn't throw up any examples here, but we've had a, a number of iSchools have been involved that are doing projects where they're actually studying scientific literature to try to get a better sense, uh, for, for example, of um, how literature impacts the field. So, for example, when you publish a paper, what is its social network uh, uh, impact um, using different techniques? That was a group out of uh, Indiana University. But nothing specifically like you're saying. But when you publish a data set. Yes, yeah, yep. Okay. Yes, sir. Oh, fascinating talk, thank you. Sure. Uh, are the soft 
uh, algorithms or the software produced uh, by the grantees open source? Is there a requirement by the funding agencies for this? It is indeed, yes. Um, everything's open source. Um, you know, we, it's interesting, um, at, the, at the NEH currently, uh, unlike the NIH, we do not have a public access policy. And we're so small, we fall underneath the threshold for the White House's public access policy. So we don't actually have one, um, which is, um, I wish we did. However, the nice thing about working with international partners is that most of them have public access policy. So as a result, the grantees did have to fall under that. So they are publishing open access. And indeed, we also require them to make their data available, typically like in GitHub or some other repository. But uh, is there a uh, place you can go to search for tools of different kinds? Yeah. Actually, did I put the website? Yeah, go to diggingintodata.org. And what you'll find on that, on that website is every single grant has its own web page. And on that web page, you'll find links to their project website, their code, papers that they've published, all kinds of good information. So just yeah, on diggingintodata.org, you should be able to find what you need. Yes, sir. Uh, thanks, Brett, for your presentation. I'm just curious about, maybe you can share something on the demographics of the people that are involved in this. Is there a generational divide, a technology divide, and also any kind of rural, underserved, urban type of communities? Interesting thanks. question. Um, I would say, on the whole, most of the, now the, the grants go to universities, and most of the universities have been what you would call R1 research universities. Um, I think that, now not exclusively, but I do think that on the whole, um, the larger universities that do a lot of this kind of research are pro possibly are more likely to have the, the staff on hand that are familiar with a lot of these techniques. Um, I think that in terms of, for example, uh, demographics, it's an interesting mix, actually. You know, we, some of the PIs are younger PIs, for sure. But on the other hand, some of the PIs are older PIs that already have tenure. Um, I, 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 don't, I, I don't know if this is much of an issue in your world as it is in mine, but in the humanities, um, the humanities is still a very conservative discipline. And if you are a young faculty member, the expectation is that you will publish traditional humanities research and traditional books until you get tenure. So it's not uncommon to see a young researcher who's really interested in digital methods kind of lay low for a while until they get tenure, and then they're free to pursue new kinds of research that they couldn't do when they were younger, which is a problem, I think, because honestly, you, you, if you've got young people that are really good at this sort of work, I'd like to see them doing it now. Um, so we, it's an interesting, you know, we, we, some, for example, some, some of the PIs have been older PIs, um, even some emeritus professors um, who have been doing work like this for many years. So it's, I, I'd say it's a real mix. So, yeah. apropos of that question, do you find that the humanities scholars are accepting or interested in the results of these studies, or is, there, is this viewed as a fad that may go away soon? <laughs> it's a really good question. Um, one of my goals with this program is to ensure that it's not seen as a fad anymore. When we first started this in 2009, I would tell humanities professors that we're doing a big data, data humanities program, and they, some of them would look at me like I was insane and from Mars, because the, all, the whole idea seemed really crazy. But a lot has changed between 2009 and today. Um, a lot of these projects, and again, one of the, another reason for doing it internationally, frankly, is to add some gravitas to the project. I want a PI to be able to say to her dean, I just got an international digging into data grant awarded by 10 different agencies. That's a big deal. I want, I want the deans and provosts and university presidents to be able to say, wow, these grant funders think this is a really important forward-thinking area for the humanities. I guess we need to be more uh, up to speed on this. And I, I'm happy to say I think that has been successful. I mean, I'm not saying this program is the only reason for that. But we have found over the last seven years that this kind of research has become more and more accepted as mainstream research. And that was kind of our goal, that we would be able to fund these sorts of projects on a day-to-day -day basis. And a number of these projects, I, I, I didn't, I actually have a slide on this, 
have received an enormous amount of public attention. I mean, literally hundreds of articles in, in the New York Times, in the Post, in Popular Science, and uh, all over the map, and not just in the United States, around the world. A lot of these projects have, have not only been of an interest to the research community, but to the general public as well. And I think that has also been very helpful in getting the word out about why these sorts of research techniques can be uh, really important going forward. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, so um, data for, big data for the humanities can have a wide range of quality from, you know, very useful to not so useful uh, sure. data. In the uh, projects that you have funded, did you see the researchers working with the data providers, this kind of collaboration to produce the data that uh, would be useful to answer the questions they were asking? Yeah, no, I, that's a great question. Um, I'll tell you, I, I, didn't, I didn't mention this in the slideshow, but one of the reasons I created this program, back in 2008 or so, um, Google started digitizing books. They, start, they, they started making deals with university libraries all around the country and around the world, actually, to digitize their collections. So we, they started building this enormous library of digital books. And we were like salivating in the humanities, like, oh my god, this is going to be an amazing boon for research. But what really angered us is that, is that Google didn't put out an API to allow you to computationally search the books. In other words, you had to just read one book at a time. So they had like 20 million books, but the best you could do is search for, for a phrase and then read that one book. A lot of researchers wanted an API or a bulk download technique uh, option so they could really get in there and computationally analyze the books. So one of, the, one of my side goals with this program was to put a little bit of pressure on the data holders, be they Google, be they the National Library of Medicine, whomever is holding the data, to say, hey, these researchers need access to your big data, and they need it in a new way. It's no longer the patron who wants to, ch to look at one book or one piece of music. These new kinds of patrons want to download every single piece of music from the 17th century at once and analyze it. Right? They want to look at 20 million books at the same time to see how language or words have changed over 200 years. And this is going to require the data holders, the libraries, the museums, the archives, the Googles, to think about new ways of making that data available to the research community. And I, and, and I do think we've been somewhat successful in that because I, I, we, we have been um, really pressuring them. I mean, I, I call up organizations like JSTOR and say, hey, you know, we're running this grant competition. Can you help out my researchers and make your uh, journal archive available? And a lot of data providers, you know, at the end of the day, they want to serve their community and they're, they, they've really been coming around. Actually, JSTOR is a great example. JSTOR now has all kinds of APIs available for doing bulk data research that, that weren't there before. And I, I think it's safe to say that programs like this put a little bit of pressure on them to start to make their data available in new ways. Yes, sir. So on that note, uh, do you have plans to update the data repositories uh, portion of the website? And also, <laughs> what are your strategies? I mean, you mentioned a little bit about JSTOR, but what are your strategies for approaching other repositories and convincing them? Uh, to add their name to your site. Um, you're talking about, on our, on our website, we have a list of data repositories, which, which you are absolutely right, has not been updated in, I don't know, two years or something like that. When we first launched the program in 2009, what we did is we would contact a data repository and we would say, hey, we're running this big data program. Are you willing to provide technical support to our researchers to make your data available? And if they said yes, I'd put their name on our website. So we actually had a list of, I don't know, maybe 50, 60 different, different repositories around the world that had agreed to make their stuff available. And we did it in part as, I don't want to say public shaming, but we wanted to just, so we wanted to highlight the people that were making the data available. We never, our researchers aren't required to use the repositories on that list, but we just wanted to highlight those that were doing it. I think that over time, though, the message got out and most repositories today are willing to make, are willing to go that extra step. So I, I, I have to confess, we sort of stopped adding new repositories to that list. Though if you know of any, just shoot me an email and I'll be happy to add them. Uh, I think it was, a, it was a bit more urgent back then um, to highlight those that were making it available. It may not be quite as urgent today. I don't know. 
Hi. Yeah, it's along similar lines. I work on the uh, PubMed Central project here, oh, cool. and we're among the people who make data available. And part of that data, I think, would be of interest in the humanities, not just the biomedical world. Oh, yeah. um, and, but I have struggled with grappling with how to make people aware that that data set is available to them. So beyond your website, do you have thoughts on where people go to find data sets that they can use for natural language processing and that sort of thing? I, I would be happy uh, uh, to, to, to help on that, actually, because we, we work very closely with not only the digital humanities community, but the computational linguistics community. And if, 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 if it comes to outreach to that community, I'd be happy to, to help in any way I can, because people are always striving for new data sets. I mean, linguists are like, <laughs> it's like they're <laughs> having huge data sets of text is, is really important to them. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. We good? All right, thank you all very much for having me today. I really appreciate it. Thank you.